Hi, good evening, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to Cosentino. I'm Ana Granados. I am the manager for Cosentino here in New York City. I see a lot of familiar faces around us, so welcome back. For those of you that it's your first time here, um, we opened this showroom in September last year. And we're very proud to finally have a space in the heart of New York City here in the A&D building. So for those of you who the first time here, please uh, take some time to walk around and admire our products. But um, before that, we have an amazing program tonight. And for that, I want you, in to, I want you to meet uh, Santiago Alfonso. Santiago came all the way from Spain just last night. He's our uh, Vice President of Marketing and Communications, and I think he's the best brand ambassador for Cosentino and Cosentino products. So we're very proud to have him here tonight. Thank you, thank you Santiago, and thank you all for being here tonight. I think I had to. <clears throat> thank, <clears throat> thank you, Anna. Uh, good evening. For those of you who may not be familiar with Cosentino, we are a family-owned company and the world's leading manufacturer of architectural surface, including natural stone, silestone quartz, and decton ultra-compact surface, a new universal application material that due to its high performance can be used for everything from kitchen and bathroom to flooring to building facade. As a company, Cosentino is very committed to innovation and we probably align with the foremost thinkers and innovators in our industry and around the world. Which is why we are so excited to be here tonight to announce a new collaboration with architect Daniel Liveskin. When Daniel first told us about his one day in life project to be celebrated in Frankfurt, Germany, it sounded so unique and completely different that Cosentino immediately agreed to support the project as a sponsor. At this moment, I would like to dedicate a special thanks to Mr. Pauli, director of uh, Alter Opera in Frankfurt. He was a great responsible as well to make possible this amazing project. What a brilliant proposal to create an event series which so wonderfully highlights the intersection of music and architecture. It was a natural alliance. Daniel knows exactly how to push the envelope and I am excited for him to share with you shortly the first look at the installation he has designed using Decton by Cosentino, called Musical Labyrinth. Labyrinth, sorry, it's a difficult word to pronounce for a Spanish person. <laughs> <laughs> Which will be a centerpiece of the event series. Again, it will be in Frankfurt, near Germany, next May. This is actually our fork or cooperation with Daniel and the studio Liveskin as a, as a whole. We first worked in, on an installation called Beyond the Wall that was presenting during the Milan Design Week in 2013 and was the later permanently installed at our global headquarters in Almeria, Spain in February 2014. I think you will receive later a uh, leaflet showing the projects I right now mentioned with this uh, till now three cooperation and with the new will be the four. Then in 2014, we partnered again of Daniel's incredible sculpture, Sonnets in Babylon, created for the Venice Architecture Biennale. Um, I think I had the good news from yesterday. Maybe this uh, sculpture is going to be displayed in Venice because this year is again the architecture are Biennale. Uh, uh, Biennale. Um, 
from the Venice University and from the municipality, they asked to use and display the game, this uh, fantastic sculpture. Daniel is a true leader, a visionary, a world-renowned architect, and someone embodies innovation, together with Nina and the rest of the team, always um, very, very focused to the innovation in the architectural world. And so it's with great honor that we announce this latest partnership, and we are very excited to welcome him today, right now, to tell you more about when they in life. Thank you, Danny. It's your time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, as you can see, I have a long relationship with Cosentino. It's a fantastic company, not only because of its products, but because of its outlook on the world that is more than just about material things. It's about culture, and it's about history, and it's about the future. Uh, let me share with you this project uh, called One Day in Life. Um, and I have to tell you, this is a small group, so I'll be very intimate with you. How did it happen? You know, I, in my previous life, I was a professional musician. That's my, you know, till I was 18. Uh, I was a virtuoso. And then my life changed for various reasons, uh, and I became an architect. Uh, some time ago, but two years ago, I was speaking uh, uh, in Munich. No, it was in, in Heidelberg. Uh, and after my little discussion, a very tall man, later I knew it, him as Dr. Pauli, head of the Frankfurt Opera, came over to me and said, Ms. Liebeskind, I am in the uh, music business, uh, and I heard you speak about architecture, but you should be doing something in music. What would you like to do? And I met him subsequently several times, and I had an instant idea to create an event, 24 hours, called One Day in Life, in which one would find the intersection to rediscover, really, that music is part of the city, and that city is music itself. And this is not just something that just came to my mind, uh, because for many years, I have considered that architecture is an extension of music, not the other way around. Not that you know, there's architecture, there's music in it. Music is really the fundamental, really fundamental dimension of human existence. It's vibrations. And architecture came out of music, but think about it historically. You know, uh, Athens, think of uh, the Parthenon. It, before it became the Parthenon, the, the sacred place for the Greeks, it was a place for music, the threshing floor, uh, the songs, the dance, which later was stabilized into a path and a place and then a building and the Acropolis and the beginning of what we call Western architecture. So, you know, many years ago, before I had a single commission, I embarked on a work called Chamber Works. I had no, no uh, clients. Uh, I had no job. But I thought that architecture is a chamber work for several reasons, just like the chamber in which it is made, the chambers which it produces. It creates a sense of structure uh, that is not unlike music. And these series of drawings, uh, Museum of Modern Art, there are only four sets, but Museum of Modern Art has one of them, a couple of other museums, and they're in private hands, is a series of uh, 28 drawings, 14 vertical and 14 horizontal drawings, which really deal with the city and architecture, not in a very figurative way, but in a very fundamental way, as I see it. And by the way, I have continued to use these drawings. These are not just drawings meant for galleries, for museums. They are really architecture drawings, and uh, they change. They change from wider horizons, which are horizontal, to very narrow horizons, also vertical. So they have to do with, with height, space, width, but also with activity and motion. And so music uh, has always been part of what I do as an architect. We know that proportions uh, are very important. We also know that the human sense of orientation is not in the eye, it's in the inner ear. Uh, we know that we would die if we didn't have music, if we didn't have a connection to music. As Shakespeare said in one of his, I don't think it's a sonnet, I think it's in one of his plays, that someone who does not have music in themselves is capable of violence. That's a beautiful thought. Only, only Shakespeare could have such a thought. That if you don't, and we see it in the Republican, uh, uh, 
So these are drawings uh, that, that, that are really musical structures, uh, which connect through, and they're drawn with ink on paper, uh, but they create a set of structures that intersect between the idea of architecture space, the city, and later on I was able to do other kinds of works also very much influenced by music before I started actually doing a building. But my very first building, which was the Jewish Museum in Berlin, I never built a building before, was also based on music. I used uh, the, the notation uh, in a particular way to complete an incomplete opera of Arnold Schoenberg. Now, I don't know whether you know the opera Moses and Aaron. Uh, Schoenberg was a great composer, one of the greatest. Uh, working in Berlin, of course, he was a Jew. He was kicked out of Berlin. And he was writing this opera, and he could not complete it. You know, the, the first two acts are there, the music is there, it's amazing, very seldom performed, very complex. Uh, and I thought he could not complete the third act because it cannot be completed in that kind of music. It can be completed in the echoes of the visitor's footsteps across the void, which is the center of that Jewish museum structure which I built in Berlin. And so, from the very beginning, I thought architecture and music are not just metaphors, and it's not a musical metaphor about architecture. It's the actual structure of music. It's the sound of music. It's the notation of music. And if you think about it, you know, as architects, uh, urban planners, city planners, we do very much what mus musicians do. We compose a score based on codes, which are historical, which have to be performed by other people for the enjoyment and for the utility of the citizens of a city. So it, the arts really do coincide. And I do believe, often I'm asked, you know, who's the greatest architect who ever lived? And I always think Bach was the greatest architect. I mean, he didn't build any buildings. He worked in these cathedrals. He was an organist. He was, but if you listen to Bach, you can see that in time, he created exactly what architects create in space. Very complex motions, very complex circulation systems, co complex for the body and also for the mind. So Frankfurt, because it's Frankfurt Opera, it's like the Lincoln Center of Frankfurt. And Frankfurt, I think, is a powerful city. Berlin is the capital, and I love Berlin. I, lived in Berlin for many years. Uh, but Frankfurt is an amazing city, not only because you know, Goethe and the uh, you know, uh, great composer Schumann and others came from Frankfurt, but Frankfurt combines kind of modernity. It's the only city that has really skyscrapers and also kind of the, the structure of German cities. And uh, part, of, part of it, of course, is the destruction during the war. But Frankfurt is the, where Frankfurt Opera is. And I was offered a chance to do this. I mean, when I said it, to Dr. Pauli and his team, I thought they would just laugh. I mean, you know, serious places of music don't do that kind of thing. I doubt that you could do it with, in New York with, you know, with the Lincoln Center. But Germany, too often people think of Germany, and I'm not advertising, I'm not an ambassador for Germany. Too many people, too many times people think Germany is a great economic leader in Europe. Now, when you look at Greece, you know, you know Portugal, you know, People think Germany is the you know, economic engine of Europe. But Germany, in many ways, is the cultural engine of Europe because its interest in avant-garde, its responsibility in history, its idea that, that thought is as important as matter. So here's Frankfurt. I don't know if you've ever been there, but it's, it's kind of a fascinating city, partly a, a traditional German city, partly this only kind of New York-like city uh, and a kind of a global city with the great airport. And you know, I think I've been to Frankfurt more times than to any other city outside of New York because I land always to take a plane to China or Africa or somewhere. So there is a city, and uh, it's really an amazing thing to, tr to, I had this kind of revelation, and it's sort of an academic revelation that in such a great city, you could, you could create this event. Uh, and I made this drawing. It's not an arbitrary drawing. I had a, in front of me a map, a, a plan, an urban plan of Frankfurt. And I thought to myself, you know, a city is a dream. City is roads, it's infrastructure, it's buildings, it's famous monuments. But basically, the city is a dream work. You know, the way we see a city is our dream of where we are, who we are. It's, it's not just objective, it's our own. And I drew this drawing. I didn't know where it was going to take me. It's a labyrinth. And I started by sort of meandering through my own idea of you know, getting lost 
in the city of Frankfurt. I created this emblematic thing which intersected with particular places which I then chose as the places for events because the events are not held in any classical uh, spaces for music outside of the Frankfurt Opera where we have the encounter at the beginning. But they are held in everyday places. They can be held in a hospital, in a swimming pool, in a boxing ring, in a library, in what would be a cross-section of life. And there are 18 of these dimensions, I thought. You know, it's not something scientific, but I thought, you know, there are at least 18 dimensions I can think of, uh, of, of a daily life. The dimension of memory, the dimension of will, the dimension of idleness, the dimension of simulation, the dimension of the text, the dimension of forgetting. The, you know, so there are these dimensions. And I thought each of these dimensions has a place in everyday life in the city. And it's a 24 hour. It's, it's from very early in the morning when we get up to go to work or whatever we do, to late at night when we fall asleep. That is the labyrinth of music. That is the labyrinth of the city. That is the emblem of this one day. And it isn't one day in life because it'll never happen again. It cannot happen again because, first of all, unique music performances by great virtuosos, which are part of it. This is not you know, student work. It's, not so, it's really at the highest musical level. And that's what I admire about Frankfurt Opera, that, that they were able to convince and attract great virtuosos to participate in this event. So the, here are uh, kind of some of the dimensions. Actually, all, all I think, simulation. That's a dimension of everyday life where we simulate. You know, it's not just virtual reality, and it's not the iPhone and the tablet, but simu simulation as part of living. And it, there is a place. Uh, you know, it's... I, I, you know, have, I will not tell you about every place that, that it is because there's a book and there is a whole chart, but you know, we can find the place where that intersection of our dreams is simulated, or the body. That's a dimension we often take for granted, that it's, you know, we have a body. And uh, in this case, I was able to convince, or the Frankfurt Opera with me, was able to convince a great hospital to give us a hospital room for a performance during a busy time, surgery. Uh, now, how did it happen? I said to Dr. Paglia, how did you get the biggest hospital in Frankfurt to allow us to have a performance? Of course, you have to put the robe, the, those special slippers, you know, disinfectant. And he said, it's easy, because the chief surgeon is a lover of music. He thought, why not give the surgical room for a performance? Now, in each of these performances, I also was lucky enough to be asked, what music would I choose? So it wasn't as if I chose the places and the dimensions, but he said, so what music would you play? So instantly, the musical opening of the door and the spatial came together. For example, in the surgical, in the surgery room, I thought it would be beautiful to perform one of my favorite pieces, which is an 18th century piece by a French composer, Marais, who wrote a piece uh, called uh, Operation for the Gallbladder. You know, it's a fantastic piece of music in which it's, it's partly sung, partly played in a very dramatic uh, parts uh, on string instruments. It's really documenting uh, the process of extraction of a gall liver without an anesthetic. I thought, this is a beautiful thing. I always wanted to hear it in a hospital. You know, I can hear it at home. I have CDs, as you do, uh, MP3s and so on. But to hear it in the hospital room, wow. And each of the pieces of music is both classical and contemporary. I wanted to, to say that it shouldn't just be ancient music or famous music, but also music of contemporary living uh, or recently living composers. So it's basically classical, classical uh, performance. Nature, great dimension. You know, again, living in cities, we sometimes uh, don't think about it, but uh, here in, in, in this incredible collection in Frankfurt, which has one of the most amazing collections of natural objects, natural things. I also thought, you know, the, immediately, and, and I'm just sort of quoting out of memory, that the first composer who deliberately composed a piece about nature, simply about nature, was Vivaldi, the Four Seasons. First composer to think about the winter, the summer, the flowers, the animals, the birds. Wow, to hear him being played in a hall which has the stuffed birds, you know, the dinosaur bones, uh, the remnants of botanical uh, 
kind of topography. That it's going to be very emotional. I think uh, this is very important for me to say that music is, of course, intellectual, just like architecture, highly structured. There is no approximate music, really. The music, even avant-garde music, is very, very precise. Even music that liberates performers and composers from structure is very highly structured, as is architecture. So that's actually the connection, the precision of architecture and music, and also the precision that it's in a place, in a place which, for example, has gravity. I thought that's a, a something not like body, but we are you know, bound to gravity. And in this case, I thought you know, the best performance for gravity would be the Archimedean principle in which you feel the displacement of your own body, body weight in water. And uh, how, how lucky that Frankfurt is very open-minded. This biggest swimming pool in Frankfurt uh, gave us the permission to use their swimming pool for the concert. And by the way, after the concert, you can go and swim. So you bring your <laughs> swimming trunks, and you hear Gubadulina, the great Russian uh, contemporary composer, uh, her fantastic offertory, you know, piece for, you know, which has to do with gra with you know, with displacement, with 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 water. Uh, you can also hear, you know, Handel's waterworks, which are not just metaphors of ships for you know the queen, but the sense of buoyancy, memory. That's that's another dimension which is so interesting, so so fundamental, really. Uh, and uh, I was able, you know, in the drawing to find a bunker. There's a bunker buried deep beneath uh, Frankfurt, used by the Nazis, used by, you know, in those terrible years, that has never been open to public. Some of these places hold only a very few people, 20 people. But the Frankfurt Opera was so clever, was able to program both the musicians and the audiences to come in times to be able to wander in uh, with different performers and so on, so that you could freshly hear something in such a space. And, and here I have uh, Luigi Nonna, one of my favorite composers, uh, Italian, uh, recently dead. He was, by the way, married to Schoenberg's daughter, uh, Arnold Schoenberg's daughter, Aaron Schoenberg's daughter. Uh, his great piece, uh, which says, don't forget what you did to us in Auschwitz. It's an amazing piece, partly electronic, partly. Uh, but I have other pieces by Ben Chaim, great uh, Israeli composer born in Frankfurt, who grew up in Frankfurt and carried this sort of weight to Palestine, to Israel, and a great composer, not, not that well-known, but contemporary. Uh, movement, uh, that's fantastic in life as in architecture. And uh, movement, uh, I thought it would be fantastic to have music in public transport. Not music, but music with great composer, great musicians and, and trams across the city. And uh, actually, because I was a virtuoso on the accordion, I was able to get uh, a fantastic accordionist, Galotti, one of the greatest in the world, who, the only one who could play a piece of, by Mankov, who created a piece called Deconstructing the Accordion. It's almost impossible to be played by any normal accordionist or virtuoso, but he is, will be playing it. Uh, necessity. Well, we all have to eat. And I thought it would be great to have a performance in a kitchen. You know, uh, an empty kitchen. A kitchen which is not cooking anything. And then I thought, you know, what is the music? I hear it. It's Ligeti's fantastic concert for 100 metronomes. You know, it's, it's metronomes set at different uh, speeds which play, and it's an amazing performance. To, I've heard it on, you know, on CD or on other, but to live in the kitchen, because it's such a pressure to cook and to eat and to enjoy, and it's all about time also. So there is necessity. Translation, that's part of the dimension of everyday life. We always are translating. There is no such thing as an original. Everything has been translated from something else, and uh, in translation, uh, we have also text. That's another dimension. Text, you know, I asked if I could go to the basement of the National Library in Frankfurt. That's, it's the only National Library is in Frankfurt. And it's, hit, it's below the National Library, is the, the bunker, deep, you know, many levels below the street, that holds every book published in the German language. I thought, you know, what does it look like? And it's a vault. You go down, no, no, no normal human being ever goes there, because the books are not to be read. They're just stored, one by one by one, as they are printed. And there are millions of books. You know, millions of books. 
And I thought this would be a fantastic place uh, to play you know, the first composer that you know, came to my mind instantly, because he invented the connection between actual word and music, and that was Monteverdi, completely the first one to really make the text luminously legible as it is sung. And I have also Peter Applinger, contemporary Austrian composer, young, who is so fantastic, but he has set music of famous, uh, famous poems, famous uh, sayings, famous people. He, took an, he analyzed their voice, and while the voice is speaking, the voice of, I don't know, Jacques Derrida, the voice of Gertrude Stein, the voice of you know, Lech Valenza, as they talk, he analyzed their, their voice into song while their text is being said by them. And each person really sings a song, language is musical. And knowledge, that's really a great, uh, you know, I thought that could happen. We don't, seldom hear ancient music in a skyscraper, or top of a skyscraper. There's a, there's a great skyscraper right next to the Frankfurt Opera. And I thought, this is where the one person that I think invented something like Shakespeare, you know, something that no one ever thought of inventing, who invented polyphony, Leontine and Perotin, the two they're called, you know, Ars Nova, uh, music of Notre Dame Cathedral, 12th century. The first people to First person, maybe people, because nobody knows exactly who was first. But Perrotin certainly is credited for the first attempt, a kind of counterpoint in music. And yeah, what would music be if, it, if we didn't have 12th century, this genius, amazing artist? So on top of a skyscraper, which also requires a lot of knowledge to be built. <laughs> so I thought, you know, Perrotin belongs in a skyscraper. He doesn't belong in a medieval cathedral, he belongs in an office building. Testament, Testament is, is a very important piece. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's a testament. And this one is uh, in, a, in the Sigmund Freud Institute, which is a beautiful building, by the way, uh, not that well known. Uh, I couldn't get all the buildings, but I wanted to go to, I wanted to have my performance in jail. It was very difficult. I, I didn't succeed in that. But uh, you know, faith, which is not really about religion at all, I thought uh, would be a great musical performance in a boxing ring. And I thought, you know, instantly, when I think of music, when I think, for example, of Liszt, Franz Liszt, that great virtuoso, the person who created, in a way, modernity of, of the piano, think of him, he transcribed Beethoven's Fifth Symphony for an orchestra of, I don't know, 100 instruments, to a single instrument. Who else would dare? Who, that's a boxing match with eternity. And only Glenn Gould, I only heard Glenn Gould ever play it, another genius. So I thought that would be the performance in a boxing ring. Not in a hall, in a nice hall with acoustic, but really just exactly where this pressure of, of everything comes to a kind of a struggle that is unique, personal, but also at a scale that is, exceeds the individual work. That's a dimension we all know, because we all work. We all have to work. And I thought here, you know, where would I stage a re Mozart's Requiem? I would stage it in a place where people are just working. I mean, during the performance, it'll be quiet. But it's a, it's a place where they fix, uh, fix uh, vehicles, cars, and trams. And I thought that's Requiem. To me, Mozart is about the redemption of the sadness of work. It's not about religion, God, and all these things that we've been told. It's, it's, it's the work. It's also Mozart. It's the work that, that cannot be redeemed anywhere but through work. Uh, and, the, uh, of course, Encounter, that's the beginning concert uh, at the Frankfurt Opera, in which uh, I was able to get uh, not only Bach to be played, but also one of my favorite contemporary composers, uh, Lachenmann, German composer, who, who has thought that for a long time, for too long a time, music has been an authoritarian art. You know, there's the conductor conducting, the players have to do what they are told, uh, they have to perform. And so he analyzed uh, music in a Marxist way. You know, it's a wage labor, they have to do, they have to work, there's a necessity, they are forced to do what they have to do. And he created a kind of a new idea of music in which the performers are given a certain freedom 
from the conductor. The conductor is given freedom from the performers, and the audience is given a freedom to hear a music that is perhaps at the beginning sounding like it's not music even, but it is highly structured, highly organized, and as beautiful as a New York street during its noisiest time when you really listen to it. It's really a piece of music. Uh, Will, that's the most daring part uh, you know, of you know, music, I think, and of architecture, because it requires a lot of will to build a building across, or a master plan, across so much public opposition, across so much emotion, across so many political enemies. And I thought, wouldn't it be amazing to have the entire 50,000 people stadium to perform a Paganini solo violin? Because that's will. I mean, Paganini, a single person who composed the variations, the works of genius, which has been transcribed by every composer and every great musician to every instrument and to every form. God, to, to have, I mean, we're not going to have 50,000 people. We don't want 50,000 people. Just a few people in an empty stadium and a great virtuoso playing on a single violin in this vast space which accommodates struggles of the will. You know, sports, soccer, all, all sorts of fantastic things. Idleness. There would be no life without just wasting time. That's an important element uh, of, of, of the city. And I thought, you know, waiting for trains, just waiting, waiting and having nothing to do, waiting for something to happen, is part of one day in life. And I have a beautiful, surprising, surprising uh, performance here. You know, wasting time. Uh, and secret. That's a fundamental dimension of life. We all have secrets, and there's a secret of the secret. It's never talked about. There's a secret, secret. And, uh, you know, I found the secret through my drawing, by the way. You know, nothing can introduce you to these things outside of a drawing, in my opinion, which you stumble upon. And I stumbled upon the central station of Frankfurt, which on this big plaza, which is right next to the red light district, is a small house in which Oskar Schindler used to live, a man with a secret. So here you'll hear something kind of amazing. I thought, you know, you could put your headphones, come there, and you'll hear, you know, Paul Salon, the claim, you know, Paul poetry, just, you know, written in 1946, 47, amazing poetry. You don't have to understand German even. Uh, or Webern, one of his very short pieces, you know, just a three-second piece of music as you're going through this plaza, red light district, restaurants, noise of the town the secrets, and of course, not everybody's going to be up 24 hours. So there's going to be music which we can provide for audiences in bed, you know, through the computer, through the iPhone, tablet. And here I thought uh, that a piece of music that is seldom performed because it requires at least 24 hours of live performance, and it will be recorded and sent to everybody as part of this, uh, is someone like, you know, Eric Satie's Vexations, which is a, a, a hypno... hypno hypnotic piece of music. It's demented. It repeats what seems to be the same thing, but there, as, as we know, there is no such thing as repetition because with every moment of time, time has changed. We can't repeat anything. We are finite. We are mortal. So, sub, unconscious. Uh, and here are you know, some of the, the, the composers, you know, contemporary. Some of them you might not know, like uh, Sariaho, a, 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 a woman who is a fantastic contemporary composer from Finland. Uh, uh, you know, old composer like Telemann, you know, uh, uh, or Sharino, fantastic contemporary composer. Uh, so again, it's an intersection of, of music, of architecture, and only the Germans, and you know, because they're high level of intent, could create a kind of meandering path where you can just walk through the city. You don't need to take buses. You don't need to take transport. Or you can just walk like a flaneur in the 19th century from obscure place to another obscure place along this emblem of the connection between music and architecture. And it's very well organized because it's organized with a fantastic parametric program where they can figure out who, which, which groups, which audiences. You, know, you can choose your own route because you know, nobody can do the 24 hours everything, but I'm going to try. But uh, it, it's not going to be possible physically to be you know, 24 hours at every performance. So you can choose your route through this labyrinth. You can decide how you want to walk through it. 
and uh, uh, that it is. There is a Cosentino's fantastic product, this uh, black carpet in front of the Frankfurt Opera with this emblematic drawing, which is, you can say, a crazy drawing. It's not a rational drawing, partly rational because it's, it's based on a plan of Frankfurt, but it's not any deliberate planning that went into it. And it's, it's just a place to walk, you know, play, enjoy yourself. And I, I think it will be uh, something interesting, something uh, just uh, on the you know, largest public space in, in one of the great cities of the world. And I think uh, people will enjoy thinking, maybe like kids, you know, you know, who don't want to step on certain lines. Remember those games where you don't step on a certain line, uh, of, you know, on, a, on the city? That the city is a dream. Uh, not only for kids, uh, but for us all. And if we put music and architecture together into a fact that they're indivisible, and too often today we have like interdisciplinary arts, like you put music, you put architecture, you put art, but that's not what I mean. It's just one thing, one unified experience. And that's what it's about. It's, it's about that experience. And uh, I hope that... Uh, you will come to Frankfurt. This is kind of uh, the oldest thought, Heraclitus. You know, I mean, you know, sixth century BC in Greece. It started with Athens, so I'm ending with Athens. That which is in opposition is in concert. And from things that differ comes the most beautiful harmony. You can't do better than this. Uh, this is a translation from Greek, but it still makes a lot of sense to us that the concert is that which comes from opposition. And in a way, as Schopenhauer said, architecture and music are the two opposites. Because music is the lightest of all that. You don't see anything. It's, there's nothing. It's, you just see the instruments. You don't see the music. And architecture, he said, is the heaviest, the most grounded, the most dark in the earth. But in a way, this is the concert. This is where things come into, into beauty and to enjoyment. And uh, I have to say that uh, I hope, whoops, I hope that uh, my special thanks to my friends at Constantine, I, I true thanks, because not every company, you know, other companies which are sponsoring, you know, Lufthansa and other, but Cosentino, particularly because it deals with architecture, is to me very meaningful because it produces things for building cities and buildings. So I think I went maybe more than 20 minutes, but that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for this wonderful, beautiful presentation. It's truly an honor to have you here tonight and to have your attention and your participation. I think we have questions. Is there some questions? We'll wait for 10 minutes. That if you if you were to recreate this in another city, what would that city be? Well, it could be any city, but it cannot be recreated. I, I think, you know, if somebody asked me to do it in New York and Berlin and Paris, I don't think I would do it. You know, you can do it only once. You know, but it's 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 just a it's a one-time thing. And uh, but I think every city deserves for its citizens to be able to discover the key to their city through music and vice versa, to discover that the music that they never knew about exists in that place, in that corner that is hardly on any tourist map or in any tourist destination. So, yeah. Well, I think I never really gave it up. You know, even though my instrument has changed completely, I hear it's still kind of, to me, this uh, very similar. You know, when you press a pencil against a piece of paper when you make a drawing, uh, it's not really different from pressing a key. And, you know, I played the accordion, which is, you know, it's an interesting inter instrument. I won't go into it too much, but it's usually associated with beggars, with gypsies, with foreigners, with refugees. Because it's a kind of, a kind of little orchestra where you blow through the bellows, the air, into, into the instrument to, to create the vibrations which you can then uh, uh, use to, to, by pushing the keys. So 
architecture is the same thing to me. You know, it needs a bellows. You need to press the bellows. It is for refugees and for foreigners and for strangers and for the others. It's not just for the obvious. It's for the others. And just like uh, the instrument I played, you have to still perform something. Very, very amazing, not just to get money on the street corner, but to create an ambience that is memorable. And that's architecture. Yeah. It's a very strange story, but it's, it's part of my life. You know, I would have never been an architect had I not played this instrument. And I'll tell you why. Uh, I played the accordion since childhood, since I was very young. I, you know, I was born in Poland. My parents were survivors of the Holocaust. And I wanted to play the piano, but my parents were scared because of our neighbors to bring the piano. You know, the Jews are bringing the piano. So they, they, they gave me the piano in a suitcase that can be hidden. It was a hidden, and I became a virtuoso uh, on that instrument. When I came to Israel and I competed in the America Israel Culture Foundation uh, Prize for Music, I won. There were only about five people who won, together with Isaac Perelman. And uh, when, uh, I have to tell you the story. When I, when I you know, there's, the room was full of young people playing cellos and, you know, oboes and, piano's voice, and there was a little door at the end, and these hundreds of kids were waiting, and their name would be called, and they would usually come out with a kind of dejected expression after five, six minutes from that room. They clearly didn't win any prize. I was called in. My father had to carry the accordion. It was so heavy. I couldn't even carry it. It was in a big box, and I strapped it. My father left the room. There were three people in the room. Zino Francescati, the great, great violinist. If you don't know him, listen to his recordings. Italian. Uh, Mrs. Kusevitsky, the wife of Sarge Kusevitsky, was the founder of the Boston Philharmonic, one of the great music patrons of all time. And Isaac Stern, uh, the famous violinist, was the head of the jury. You know, they looked at me really in the beginning when I stepped their accordion. They said, like, this person is in the wrong room. Like, we don't, you know, this is a classical music competition. We don't, you know, they, they kind of smiled benevolently. But I think when they've heard that, I've, maybe after the third chord of the Toccata in D minor, which I transcribed from Bach, into the accordion. They stopped smiling. I saw seriousness on their faces. And when I ended uh, my performance with really a kind of a bravura piece, uh, Rimsky-Korsakov's Flight of the B Bumblebee, which is very difficult, it's a, uh, they smiled. And Isaac Stern came over, and he put his hand on my shoulders. And he said to me, I don't know whether he used my last name or my first name, but he said, Mr. Liebeskin, Daniel, he says, you have to give up this instrument because you've already exhausted all the possibilities you have to play the piano. And to me, that was like, you know, he undermined all my thought because I thought of the accordion as my future. And suddenly, I realized that it's very difficult to go from the vertical of the accordion to the horizontal of the piano. But I did perform uh, in many venues, in town hall, many here in New York with, with Isaac Perelman. Uh, Daniel Barenboim won the same scholarship the year before. I performed with Ashkenazi. I performed uh, in only classical music. And it was a bizarre performance, I assure you. Because, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's, you know with great violinists and great uh, instrumental, you don't expect the accordion to be part of that venue. But, you know, when I think about it, actually, that's what I do in architecture, too. It's kind of what I do is not really part of the going rate, the things that is normally done. It's, it's what I do. And maybe that's partly uh, the trajectory of how I played music on this strange instrument and how that instrument took me to architect. Had I played the piano, I probably would have never even thought about being an architect. No, there would be no reason. <laughs> Hi. I guess, um, how long did it take you to create one day in life? It came to me in a second. Everything, really, I'm not exaggerating, even the music composition, but it took a long time, maybe a year and a half, for Frankfurt Opera to make it you know, they have a team, a large team of experts. You know, these spaces, some of them are, you know, not even safe to be used. They have to be made safe for the public. They don't have lighting. Some of the, you know, they don't have, you know, they have to be, so you have to have an incredibly intelligent team to be able to scout out these places, 
make them usable, convince the authorities, make all the par arrangements, and then also to be able to organize this, this, you know, uh, this thousands of people being able to enjoy the experience at every venue at whatever scale it is, whether it's the stadium or you know the bunker. But uh, no, the, the thought came to me instantly. It's not an academic thought. I didn't go and start thinking about mo what music would I play. Uh, it's like I just you know these places that appeared in the city, and I think everybody has those places. I, I think after this performance, as you walk through any city, New York or whatever, you'll you'll hear that piece of music that you love or that you've heard or that you want to hear in a particular uh, intersection, corner, some, some, some place that is just a regular secular place. It's not the Lincoln Center, Carnegie Hall, anything like that. So yeah, that's how it happened. How did it come about that you transitioned from music to architecture? My wife asked me this question also for, for two reasons. Number one, really, I think I used to earn more money when I was 15, 16 years old than I do now. Per hour. I was paid huge sums of money. As a, you know, because when you appear on a stage by yourself in front of a large audience as a virtuoso, you know, you're, you're paid. You know, even that, back then, you know, thousands of dollars for... A, 10-minute performance, 15-minute performance. But uh, I don't know really how. I have to tell you, I don't really know how I wind up in architecture. It's, it's, it's a mystery to me. Why did I wind up in architecture? I have no idea. I have really no idea. I know that I was interested in mathematics. You know, when I came to America as an immigrant, I, I went to the Brown School of Science, which at that time was specializing in uh, making sure that all the students from the school would catch up with the Russians in space technology. And I was put into a special class against my will, you know, for advanced calculus and particle physics and all this stuff. And I really disliked it, but I loved science. My son now is a theoretical astrophysicist. Uh, but, you know, somehow architecture appeared on my horizon. And when I applied to school, when I applied, you know, in the last week of, of applications, I just asked my sister, like, what is a free school in New York? So my sister went to City College. I said, like, what schools can I go to? She said, you can go to City College. You can go to Cooper Union. You know, she gave me like three or four uh, uh, tuition-free schools. And when I applied to Cooper Union, it's true, here in this great city, the great school, I remember that the people who were interviewing said, like, what is someone with your background doing in architecture? You shouldn't be here. You should be going to MIT, go somewhere else. I said, no, no, architecture seems to be a nice field. I didn't know anything about it. I, I have to tell you, I never in my life met an architect. You know, I grew up in the Bronx. Uh, in a working class, you know, people worked in factories. I didn't know anybody who was professional. I didn't know any doctor, lawyer, engineer, accountant. It was just people who worked in factories. So I had no idea what architecture was. Not, and I still don't. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Daniel, again. Thank you, everyone. I now encourage you to stay and enjoy the, the food, the drinks, and the special music that we have tonight. So thank you, everybody, and enjoy the party. <laughs>